Tim, in trying to understand the fundamental question of humanity, the old mind-body problem, what is the relationship between our mentality and our physical brains? I'm fascinated by the fact that so many very smart people gravitate to the extremes. And one extreme says the, that everything in the mind can be entirely reduced to the brain. We don't understand it today, but surely we will, and we're getting very close, a sort of neurophilosophy. And on the other hand, some people say that that's crazy, there's a neuromania, that we think we can do that and we never can. And the, the, the two extremes, how, how do you balance these or not? Truth is not necessarily in between. Truth is truth wherever it falls. Truth is truth wherever it falls. And, and uh, often it doesn't fall in the extremes. Sometimes it does. One just shouldn't assume that it, it never does, but it, but it often it doesn't. And in this particular case, I think it doesn't. Um, so I, I'm not a neuroskeptic, uh, but I'm not a coward carrying neurophilosopher, at least on some interpretations of that phrase either. I think it's very difficult to bring findings in neuroscience into conversation, into interesting conversation with philosophical debates. I think it can be done and I try and do it. But I think it's very, very challenging. I think it's much harder than many, many people think. Merely knowing that certain areas of the brain light up. And it, it, actually we should say that the brain doesn't light up. It's the, the fMRI pictures that we see the metabolism we can check in the brain. Yeah, but those aren't pictures. Aren't, those aren't photos. Right, right. The colors, people don't realize this. They're seductive. The colors are markers of areas of activation. Right. Um, so they're seductive. That's, that's part of the problem here, that these pictures are seductive. We think we're seeing a more direct mm -hmm. picture of what's going on than we are. There's various models are in between us, in between the brain and the fMRI pictures. But people think that once you've got that kind of data, it's going to directly impact on a philosophical debate. So, you know, what's the structure of moral decision making? Um, does it involve rules? Does it involve emotions? This kind of debate has been going on with philosophers for centuries. Uh, and people think, well, if we can do some brain scans, we see which bits of the brain light up, um, we can solve that debate. I don't think we can dismiss that approach in principle. In principle, evidence from any area can, in principle, be brought to bear on philosophical debates, but it's hard. It's hard. Often what we just have is correlations. The correlations don't tell us much in the way of, they don't give us much in the way of explanatory payoff. Certainly the number of neuroscientists who believe that the data coming out of neuroscience, the imagery, the, the uh, recording from single nerve cells, uh, are extremely uh, relevant to dealing with yep. the philosophical problems uh, of, of all aspects of, of our mentality. Yep. The large majority of neuroscientists feel that way. Yep. In fact, some would, would even dismiss all of philosophy as, uh, as not relevant, and all we really know is the neuroscience. That's right. Some would, some would say that. Here's how I think the neuroscience can be very relevant and very important to philosophical debates. Uh, we approach a domain with a bunch of categories. So if we're talking about human behavior in ordinary context, we talk about beliefs, desires, intentions. Why did she run away? Well, she believed that there was something coming towards her, that, you know, a wild animal coming towards her. That's why she ran down the hiking path, right? And so now you've got that explanation of your friend's behavior. There's a question as to whether the explanatory categories we have, belief, desire, intention, and the like, are really the best ways to understand the mind. Mm -hmm. And lots of philosophers have worried that they might not be. And what we might be starting to get from cognitive neuroscience, so maybe low-level neuroscience isn't, isn't where we need to look. We need to look at higher levels of, of description, cognitive neuroscience. But we might be starting to see the emergence, and people call this cognitive ontology, that's the term of art people are using for some of, work, some of this work, the emergence of a new taxonomy, a new set of terms and categories that we can apply to, to human behavior. What are some of them? Well, it's, you, you, you can't really put them into words, so to speak, because the only words 
<laughs> I mean, that, 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 that's, that's precisely the, the best question to ask, but it's the hardest question to answer. Yeah. Because the words we have are drawn from our everyday experience. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, the answer to the question would be a picture in multidimensional space of neural activation. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, so in order for us to employ this kind of taxonomy to explain why your friend walked down, you know, why someone did something, right? Why you took this job rather than that, that job, um, we would need a new language. We would need to develop a new we would either need to speak in the language of multidimensional state spaces and neural functioning and neural firings. Yeah. Um, oh, and presumably we're not going to do that. We're going to coin some term to try and capture these, these differences. And, and I mean, do you think that will make progress in the big philosophical question? I think it makes a certain amount of progress. I don't think all the big questions go away. But I think if, if, if one of the big questions in philosophy is what is the nature of the mind and the mental yeah. states? Not what, not, the, not what the relationship is between the mind and the brain. This is a slightly different question. Right, right, right. But what's our conception of the mind? Then I think this work is starting to say, well, we intuitively, in an everyday sense, have a certain conception of the mind. But we need to augment that or supplement that or tweak it a little bit and bring in a bunch of new categories to explain various types of behavior that that it's very difficult to explain if you're only allowed to talk about beliefs and intentions and desires and memories and the like. 